You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hi there, listeners of the Useless Information Podcast. My name is Sam Hume, host of a podcast called Pax Britannica, and Steve has very kindly allowed me to tell you all about it. Pax Britannica is the history of the largest empire the world has ever seen, an empire which, more than any other, and for good or ill, has made the world we live in today. Beginning with the reign of James VI and I, the narrative has covered the plantations of Ireland, the settling of Virginia, the gunpowder plot, English piracy, Scottish witches, and the king's endless attempts to unite his kingdoms into one, single, British crown. Pax Britannica will detail the next 400 years of conquest, war, slavery, politics, trade, colonisation, revolution, rebellion, and the rise of the modern world. If any of that sounds interesting to you, give Pax Britannica a try. You can find the show on Facebook, Twitter, and everywhere you find good podcasts, like perhaps where you found useless information. Now, on with your regularly scheduled podcast. Useless information. Hi everyone. Welcome to part two of my interview with cartoonist Lee Rubin. Now, just in case you didn't hear part one, which was the story of his parents being the first Jewish couple ever married on television and how that almost didn't happen, I strongly encourage you to go and download the episode and take a listen to it. It really is a great story. Today, in part two, Lee discusses how he got his start in cartoons, from creating his first greeting cards at his dad's printing business, right up through where he is today, creating the Rubes cartoons for hundreds of newspapers across the country. It's a fascinating discussion, so I really do hope that you'll enjoy it. So let's take a listen. I want to talk a little bit about how you got into art. I mean, uh, you know, how you became a, a cartoon artist. Sure. Well, I had always wanted to be a cartoonist ever since as long as I can remember. And the, the first cartoon that I ever drew was in kindergarten. And it was a picture of a giant, but the giant was so big, I had to put his head on the other side of the piece of paper. And so my, you know, kindergarten teacher really thought this was hilarious. And my parents thought it was really funny, even though I wasn't really trying to be funny. It was just the solution to the problem, which is pretty much all cartooning is, is figuring out a solution to the problem and sometimes working backwards in it uh, and with the goal of making something funny every day. But from and from kindergarten through, you know, where all of elementary school, junior high, high school into college, I, I knew I wanted to be an artist. And I was an advertising arts major in college, uh, but realized that I didn't quite know how to make my living as an artist until I was walking through a, a store one day, a pharmacy, and I saw this line of cards by the fabulous uh, cartoonist, greeting card artist, author uh, Sandra Boynton, and who's still very popular. And she did this line of cards that I just loved. And I thought, hey, why don't I start a greeting card company? I know how to run a printing press uh, and I can draw the cards while the presses are running. And uh, and there it was. <laughs> That's how it got started. So, I mean, you were kind of lucky that your dad owned a printing company. Well, I, I didn't think I was so lucky at the time, but yeah. No, I mean, he was great. He's great to work with. But no, I, you know, I learned a lot of skills. You know, you're dealing with customers, you know, mom and pop business. So you're you're sweeping the floor, you're cleaning the bathroom, you're uh, making coffee, you're handling, you know, customers, ordering wedding invitations, whatever, answering the phone. Just whatever it whatever it took, because it was family business. I look back on those years pretty fondly now. At the time, maybe I was thinking, nah, I don't really want to do this for my my life's work. But I used the uh, the. Having the equipment there, my dad says, you know, you can do on your own time, whatever you want, as long as you get your work done. So I said, you know, that's great. And I created this one little terrible greeting card and put it on the counter and sold it for 50 cents. And I thought, wow, I really like that. Someone's buying my art. So that's the very beginning of the greeting cards. Obviously, at some point you had to move out of your, you know, sell them to other people besides people who are coming into your store. How did you get them into stores in the region? Well, I I went to a stationary show in Los Angeles, 
and was looking around for different sales reps or ideas. And I had heard about the New York stationery show, uh, either through a trade magazine or something of the kind. And, and this, these one sales rep said, well, if you get enough uh, cards together, we can represent you in New York. Yeah, of course, I had to pay them. And I said, sure, I'll be happy to do that. And I flew back there, too. I think it was the stationery show in 1979 when it was in uh, Columbus Circle. And uh, I took some some real orders there. I mean, I had about 64 different designs by that time, and I found a company to make uh, wire racks, spinner racks for the cards. And uh, it kind of just took off from there. And by take off, I mean, it was sustaining itself. It wasn't a get rich quick scheme. So how did you get into, I mean, obviously you have the greeting cards and that's taking off. How did that lead into doing a daily comic strip? Well, there was a little, little thing in between there, little break. I was kind of getting burnt out doing the greeting cards because I was doing so much of it by myself that I came up with a character based on the same character that appear in all my greeting cards. And I turned it into a musical note. And I made about 12 different cartoons with really terrible musical puns and printed them up and matted them and started selling them at street fairs. And people just love these things. They, I, they became notable quotes. And at one of these street fairs, this guy comes up to me and said, you, you should do a book of these. And I didn't have enough to do a book, but I said, OK. So I wrote a book and then which had about 80 cartoons in it and then printed up 5,000 copies of a paperback book. And I don't know if you can imagine how many books 5,000 is. Well, you probably can because you're an author. Yeah, but I've, I have I have to say I've never had 5,000 in my possession at one time. I'm not even sure I have 5,000 books in my library at home, but uh, it is quite a lot of books. It's a lot of books. And, um, and I mean, you know, keep in mind, I was, I think I was still living at home. Well, no, I think I had moved out at that time, but the books were stored at their house and they would like to get rid of them. So I had made it my mission to sell them. So I would go, I had still my contacts from the greeting card industry and they would sell these books and they went very, very well in B Dalton and Walden books. If anybody out there remembers those stores, they were the major chains at the time. And uh, it, as it turned out, I, I took six months. I sold the first 5,000 and actually first book went into eight printings. So, wow. Yeah, so it wasn't bad. I sold 40,000 of those books. And from that, I was doing a book signing at a Walden Books in Lancaster, California, and the local newspaper there uh, called the Antelope Valley Press. Uh, they sent their uh, ed entertainment editor out to interview me, and he really liked the cartoons. And we became friends and would go out, have a beer every now and again. And he asked if I wanted to draw a daily cartoon for their newspaper. And I said, yeah, of course I do. You know, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, the rest is is history, <laughs> so to speak. Drawing greeting cards or doing a book, I mean, that's not quite the volume of drawing a cartoon every single day. How difficult is it to create a new cartoon every single day, you know, 365 days a year? Well, all I can say is be careful what you wish for, <laughs> because... Because this is my 35th year of doing it daily. Um, in all honesty, I don't have to draw one every day, just most days, because I do get vacation time, uh, you know, every year. But it pretty much rounds out to, I'll, I'll say 365. Why not? Because in all total, counting all my cartoons over the years, it's probably been that many. How has the industry changed over, you know, since you've been in it so long? I mean, certainly newspaper world has change i mean there are less and less newspapers there are sadly more and more ads in them and less and less news and less and less comics in each one uh how has that affected you well i can say that the uh it has affected me of course and i'm probably most cartoonists because you know it's a less competitive market there's i can't even think of any towns really rare other than maybe new york city or that have competitive newspapers because even even in the 80s and 90s, it was very, very strong. It was a very strong newspaper market. And then it's just kind of, you know, with the Internet kind of uh, cutting into that and all the classified ads going on to Craigslist. And, uh, you know, it's it's definitely impacted this beautiful 
this beautiful vehicle for cartoons, <laughs> essentially. Um, and, you know, because, you know, my dad grew up reading cartoons and, you know, and I grew up reading cartoons and a lot of people, you know, read cartoons uh, and still do. Uh, still, they're they're hanging on. I mean, I don't know where it's all going to go. Uh, if it, maybe it'll all go digital, you know, that seems to be the, the trend. Although I'm still a newspaper guy, and you're right, the newspapers have gotten smaller because now, uh, you know, the the burden, if you want to call it that, is more on the subscriber because it used to be the advertising is what paid for the newspaper. Now it's, it's the advertising and a lot more of that. That responsibility is on the on the consumer, which is, you know, me, the guy that's buying the newspaper and everybody else that still subscribes. So question I have for you is that you do single cell uh, cartoons, but most cartoon, you know, most comics that are in the newspaper are multi cell. Why did you choose the format of a single cell versus multi cell? Yeah, well, I mean, it's actually in the, the technical term is a panel. I do a panel okay. cartoon, um, but I do I do break it up sometimes in, into two or sometimes even three and maybe four. Uh, but I still I love that quick in and out uh, gag. You don't you know, you have to tell a story very quickly. Uh, there's going to be a lot going on in that one little panel for people to get. And, you know, I have a saying I, I don't. I, the idea is so if someone gets the cartoon or the joke within 15 seconds, but I really don't care if it takes somebody two weeks to get it because I've had people say that. They'll say, you know, it took me, you know, it took me two weeks to get that gag. I go, good, good. It's a much more rewarding experience that way and more memorable. But I'm, I'm not purposely trying to fool people. I just like them to think about stuff. So how did you become involved with RIT? That's, that's very nice of you to ask that question because, okay, so I was contacted last year by the Dean of Liberal Arts who had this idea to bring me in as a, their cartoonist in residence. And I had never heard of a cartoonist in residence before. Um, I guess I could back up a little. I've done a lot of events in Rochester. Uh, with the, the newspaper there, the Democrat and Chronicle and the Strong Museum of Play, the, uh, you know, the fantastic toy museum, National, uh, help me out here. National, uh, it's like the National Toy Museum or something. I can't remember exactly myself. Uh, I did mention in one of my podcasts. Yeah, you did. And, and, and so I've done a lot of events there. I also did the Jewish Book Festival at their, uh, which was is very well attended uh, at their uh, Jewish Community Center several years ago. So I've done a lot of live events in Rochester. So I guess, and I've spoken at RIT before, which is Rochester Institute of Technology for those people who don't know that, which is a fantastic uh, collection, I guess, of colleges under under the, the name Rochester Institute of Technology, uh, nine different colleges, and they brought me in to be their cartoonist in residence, which it's a, I may be the first cartoonist in residence ever. I'm not sure. I don't know of anybody else that has been. I, so I'm not going to make that claim, but certainly one of the few. It is quite an honor. I mean, uh, you know, you sent me a link about your parents and, you know, the name didn't mean anything to me. But as soon as I clicked on the link for your website, it's like, wow, I know your work. So, I mean... So it's definitely out there. I mean, I don't even read the comics in the newspaper, and, and I recognize it in a second. You know, your, your style is is just very memorable. Uh, and I do have a question for you about that. Is, I mean, you tend to focus on cows. Is there a reason for that? Well, I focus on a lot of things. <laughs> but, you know, whatever comes to mind, what's ever funny that day, um, from dinosaurs to astronauts, I was to vegetables. It doesn't matter. I do like drawing animals a lot. I've always liked to draw animals, and cows are just kind of funny you know they're big and they're easy to well they're easy to draw for me and I, they're black and white so they look really good on the comics page if you're drawing a holstein and and they really make great stand-ins for people because you know if you want to make a joke about udders it's easier to do that than the equivalent body part on a human you can't really do that on the comics pages anyway of you know family newspapers so they're they're just wonderful characters, and I do a lot of barnyardy, you know, or agricultural slant on on the cartoons as well. So, 
clearly you're a very good uh, cartoon artist. Are you also a very good, you know, you know, classic arts? I know what you would exactly refer to you know, someone who does sceneries and things like that, or is that not really what you're good at? Well, I thank you for, for that. Other people might disagree, but I'm going to go with your opinion uh, on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, I don't, I, I used to be able to, <laughs> years ago in college, I could do real realistic stuff and I was pretty good at it. You know, nothing that I would go professional grade with, but I, I just really fell in love with cartooning. And, and, you know, and part of the, the art of cartooning is the right words. So, I mean, it's, it's two different things, you know, that are coupled together. You have to make, you have really have to make them sing, uh, so to speak, or, you know, they really have to have, I mean, I try to have a bit of an attitude with the cartoon. I don't mean a bad attitude. I just, I want it to be a memorable experience for people. I, I definitely tend to like the one panel uh, you know, cartoons that, you know, you, as you said, you either get them or you don't, you know? Yeah. It's like, it's a, to me, it's, it's, it's a fun kind of a, a, maybe a minor challenge. You want, you want to, you want the reader to feel rewarded. When we spoke a few weeks ago, you sent me a link for a TV pilot that you're working on. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, well, it's a TV show. Originally I had this concept because everybody else had done a reality show. I mean, everybody else has done a reality show about something or other. And I thought, what can I do to contribute to the fall of Western civilization? Why well, don't I do a reality show? So I, I, it turns out I, I have a friend of mine that did a television show, uh, you know, created, produced, directed it, sold it to ESPN. It was called uh, American Dragster. And I floated the idea by him. I said, hey, uh, hey, Ryan, his name is Ryan Johnson, very, very talented guy. How would, uh, what do you idea, think of this idea about doing a, you know, a, a show based on a life of a cartoonist? You know, how they come up with ideas or whatever. And he goes, well, we need a concept. We need something, you know, a little more solid. So I took some time and came up with an idea and it morphed from, we, we went through a lot of incarnations of this thing until we decided, I know, why don't we go behind the scenes of other creative people and see what it, what they do to make their creation, you know, what's the thought process? How do they do it? What makes it interesting? And during the time, Ryan also owns a very successful special effects uh, prop company that you know, for TV and movies and and uh, theatrical. And so we have the we both have kind of weird jobs. I draw cartoons and he makes, you know, like swords for like Game of Thrones and bottles that sure. you can break over people's heads and and fake limbs for horror movies. He actually does that and it's pretty creepy stuff, you know, and it looks very real creepy stuff. And so we, we kind of, we, we both are in the TV show and we visit these various folks who are creatives, go behind the scenes. And then I also create cartoons about that while it's occurring. And the show is stitched together with these little interstitials of, of cartoons. And the pilot is, uh, you know, it's, is online if, if you, care to share that link with your readers that'd be wonderful sure i'll, I'll post it to the website so we can click on it and see it sure we're actually filming uh some for the next episode at rit um because ryan is coming back for that he's also going to be teaching some classes there because he's super smart guy about you know engineering stuff and and creating stuff very very bright guy so i'm not i'm not just saying it he really is as as a, a friend of mine said, what the show you're doing is like dirty jobs for the creative set, which I, I really like that tag. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was not what I expected. I thought it would be kind of boring, but it wasn't. It was very interesting. Well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. As I mentioned to you, I got this crazy idea for a reality show, which is unlike anything that's on TV, but I definitely don't have the context for it. Um, I came up with it. This is going to sound really bad, but... I was listening to a Rick Springfield album and it popped in my head while I was listening to it. It was a live album and I'm like, you know, some I, I just took pieces of this album I was listening to and, and somehow in my head I made it into a show. And it's it's not like really a reality show, but it's not really a classic show either. So it's just somewhere in between. It's just kind of been flowing around the back of my head. And honestly, I hadn't thought about it in years till I looked at your thing. I was like, hmm, you know. Maybe someday I got to do something about this. I'm just kind of amazed uh, sometimes with my ideas that nobody's ever stumbled across it, you know? Right. Why don't you tell everyone what your website is? 
Oh, rubescartoons.com, R-U-B-E-S, cartoons, plural, dot com. And I know you're selling merchandise on there, so why don't you describe what you can purchase there? Well, I really don't sell anything typically directly, maybe some magnets, uh, but there's uh, T-shirts, books, calendars. Uh, what else is on there? Geez, I don't know, you know. Uh, prints or prints are fairly popular. People want a print of a certain cartoon. They can get that. And I'll, I'm always uh, happy to inscribe it to them or sign it, uh, you know, as a gift. Uh, I was surprised to see that uh, the T-shirts you'll put any des- they can put any design that you have on a T-shirt. I think there were, I think I said there were thousands I could choose from. They can, well, they can. Yeah, there's there's only about 50 or 60 pictured there because we don't have I think I have about 12,000 cartoons that I've done over the years. But people do right. Hey, do you remember that cartoon you did back and whatever? And I'm pretty good at remembering that. And I can, uh, what I do is I email the image to the, the guy that can make them, uh, and he make them and ship them directly to whoever is ordering it. And all that's through, you know, on the website. So, so Steve, I'm a big fan of your podcast and I know you've mentioned it. You have an invention and I'm wondering what, uh, what, what's happening with that? Well, I've kind of put it on hold for a bit. Um, you know, uh, I go through different stages where I'm trying to find different avenues for it. I did uh, Kickstarter for a while, but nobody looked at that. And it probably wasn't the best avenue for it. But oddly, just the other day, I was driving to work, and in my head, I just realized I had a really, really good improvement to it. So now I'm starting to think about it again. But unfortunately, you know, I live in the middle. Of, you know, I wouldn't say I live in the middle of nowhere, but... I'm definitely not in an area where anyone deals with importing, exporting of goods or manufacturing of low-end plastics. So I don't really know where to turn. Um, I've tried approaching you know, some of the uh, pet manufacturers at the trade shows, but they're really just the representatives there, and I don't know how to get a hold or get in touch with the right people at these companies. Oddly, I was getting my hair cut just a couple of months ago, and my uh, barber, somehow in conversation, he never knew that I had a patent. And it came up in conversation, and he was just so excited because he has reptiles. He says, this is, this is like the greatest thing. I need one of these. And he's like, you know, you got to go to this company. It's coming. I can't think what it is. And I said, well, the perfect company for me is a company called Zoomed. And uh, he said, yeah, that's the company. And the two of us both agree that is like the perfect company for my invention. It's not one of these mega companies, you know, that, you know, basically just want to buy your invention and bury it. But they're big enough where they'd actually uh, – you have a little bit of backing behind and be able to develop into a good product. So if there's anybody out there who has any connection with the pet industry, you know, who knows a manufacturer may be interested in this. Uh, it is basically an expandable cage. I mean, you go and you buy a cage today and it's one size. This you can just expand forever. You can give your pet more and more and more space. And so if there's anybody out there that's in the pet industry or has contacts or if there's anybody's in the plastic industry who has access to, you know, kind of lower end plastics, not the high expensive ones, uh, let me know. Sure. No, I was going to say, uh, have you tried contacting that company directly and pitching them? I have spoke to the rep from the company, um, and oddly, he really liked it, but um, and, and I'm quite certain they're aware of it, but I'm not really sure it's gotten to the people that really need to hear it. Well, maybe, you know, I guess, you know how many cold calls I made? <laughs> you just got to make a cold call. It's not that hard. <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll just they'll just either want to see something or you hang up on you. <laughs> you know, you can do that. I'm sure you could. And it, it sounds like a very cool invention. You know, my, my uh, anaconda now is up to 75 feet. You just keep adding. <laughs> you know, keep it's it's bizarrely uh, um, I've had I've had interest from Amazon. They contacted me several times about it. The first time I showed it, uh, PetSmart, Petco, um, they've all expressed interest in it. But uh, the Petco rep, the guy I spoke to at this trade show, he thought because it's really large, it should be for large animals. And I tried to explain to him that's that's the wrong, not what I'm really after. I want to give small animals a lot of space. Uh, we have this mentality that a small animal has to go in a small cage and a big animal should go in a big cage. I think all animals should have as much space as possible. And and that's what this allows. So you can go out and buy you know, a small cage, and then what happens is you decide it's too small, so you just buy more pieces. It's like the toy connection. You just keep expanding outward and outward and upward and backward. And if you want, you can fill an entire room with the cage. 
And I've been in the industry, I mean, I started in the pen industry when I was 14, and I'm 55 now. And I know for a fact there's never been an expandable cage like this. No one, no one is, people have tried, but they just missed it. And uh, I think I figured it out. I'm, actually, I'm quite certain I figured it out. And uh, hopefully I can find somebody that, uh, that will agree with that. Uh, well, I shouldn't say that. I, I definitely have found companies that have really liked it, but they're not in the right industry. They may be cat or they may be dog or, or, they're, or they're a dealer or they're a distributor, but they're not the people that actually make it. It, there's probably it's probably a very limited amount of companies that do that, and that would be the those would be the folks to call. I I don't know who else you would call. You know, if they're all if they're tooled up and have the distribution, because that's key to any invention is having a distribution. Because you know, otherwise, have a good have a good attorney and good distribution. <laughs> that's the those are the two things. I always had a good attorney when we did stuff. So anyway, so uh, not blabbing about that. I just want to thank you for being on the show. It, it, I really do appreciate that you took the time to talk to me today. Oh, it's, it's, it's been my pleasure. And it's, it's really fun to share this little bit of a television history, you know, about my folks with, uh, with your audience. Well, thanks again. Sure. Well, that concludes another episode of the useless information podcast. Once again, I really want to thank Lee Rubin for sharing his story with us. I'll remind you that his comic is titled Rubes, and it appears in hundreds of newspapers across the country. So be sure to check out his website, that's rubescartoons.com, and you can also see a great collection of Rubes on gocomics.com, as well as his Facebook page. If you'd like to see the video that Ruben's getting married on television, I've posted that along with photos of his parents and the script on my website, which is uselessinformation.org. A quick reminder that I'm in the process of writing my third book. While I'm just getting started on it, it will be similar to what you hear on this podcast, and most of it, actually nearly all of it, will be brand new content. If you go to my website at uselessinformation.org again, all you have to do is click on the image of the book on the left, and then you can fill out the Google form that it links to, and then I can send you occasional updates as the publication date draws nearer. Now, I do have a really big favor to ask of everyone out there listening. My rankings on iTunes have suddenly plummeted. Since I started this podcast 11 years ago, I've consistently been in the top 30 of their history podcasts. Now I'm suddenly ranked number 254, which basically means that no one new will find the podcast. So it would be greatly appreciated if you could somehow share this podcast with anyone that you can think of, whether it be via social media, in conversation with others, or however you choose. That will help me to grow the audience and, of course, keep this podcast alive. And speaking of social media, be sure to sign up for my Twitter feed. It's at UselessInfoCast, and that will enable you to be among the first to know when a new episode is released. You can also like the show on Facebook. Just do a quick search for the Useless Information Podcast. Of course, you can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts, which is also known as iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, TuneIn, or through any of the leading podcast platforms. Anyway, thanks for listening, for any help you can offer in spreading the word about this podcast, and I hope you'll tune in the next time. Bye.